Welcome to part two of accounting adjustments with Eduhans. Today we're going to be working through a few more adjustments and the impact of it on the statement of comprehensive income and statement of financial position. So let's get into it. The information we're going to be using from the Western Cape Department of Education and you can find the resources on their website. For further information and more videos on um, topics in accounting, you can check www.eduhans.co.za. So the example we're going to do is, it says provide for interest on the mortgage loan from South Bank at 15%. PA means per annum, so that's an annual rate. But they've asked you to account for the interest for the month of June. Interest is capitalized. Okay. So, before we get into the numbers, the section and item that will be impacted here is interest expense. Okay? So that's what's going to be reflected here. Now, in order to determine the amount, let's look at what information we were given. So, We're given here a few interest amounts. We have interest on mortgage loan currently at 31200 in the pre-adjusted trial balance, as well as the mortgage loan from South Bank of 644000 So we need to account for interest. So let's just take over that amount, 644,000 and 31,200. So if we say what is going to be 15% of that loan balance per annum. And when you divide it by it will give you a monthly interest of 8050. So how did I get that? I took the balance of the loan as per the pre-adjust trial balance of 644,000 times 15%, which is the per annum, and then I divided by 12, which will give me 8050 for the month of June. If you recall that there was interest recognized of 31,200. So the total amount that will be, it will be 31,200 plus 8050 to give you a total of 39,250 that will go in our interest income line item. Sorry, interest expense. So it's an interest expense line item. Okay, now before we identify what's going to be the impact of the statement financial position, there was a second adjustment that we had to do for the loan. So the next one was the capital repayments on the loan of 4200 per month will be paid in the next year. Now this amount excludes 
interest that will be paid in the next year. Okay, so that's why it says capital repayment. Now, this is very important. What do you do with this information? Well, firstly, you can use it to calculate the amount that will be paid next year. Now, it excludes the interest. That's very important. We'll get to that just now in a second. So because we have this loan, we have a portion that's going to be paid next year. If you recall in the balance sheet, we split up any amounts that will be paid in the next 12 months from the total loan balance to put it in the current section. And the tra trade and other payables, or you can put it as a separate liability and not in trade and other payables, but you can call it current portion of mortgage loan. And this will be under current uh, liabilities. And the amount will be 4,200 times 12. Just calculate what that is. That will give you 50,400. Okay, now there is no sort of specific adjustment in terms of a journal entry. It's a disclosure adjustment. And there is no impact on your statement of comprehensive income. It is just taking out a portion to put in the current uh, liability section. In your non-current liabilities, for loan, South Bank, you're going to calculate an amount. Now that amount will be the balance that we had in our trial balance of 644,000, plus we capitalize the interest that we ad adjusted for, and then we subtract the amount that's going to be recognized in current liabilities. And then that will give us a total of 601,650. So we did two things. We did the adjustment for the interest expense for the month of June, as well as taking out the portion that must be separately disclosed and the current liabilities in your balance sheet. Now, it's very important that the amount that you're going to put under the current liability section only refers to the capital repayments within the next 12 months, not the interest. The interest repayments will not be subtracted. It will just be the capital repayments. Okay. Let's continue. So we have details of sundry expenses at year end. And let's work through them. First, we have stationary on hand that was estimated at eight hundred rand. And then we have packing materials. Counted to be 1,600. So let's have a look and see if we have any items in our trial balance that relates to it. So on the balance sheet side, there's nothing that comes up. On the nominal account side, we have sundry expenses of 9,200. Okay, so what has happened here? 
we have expensed all our sundry expenses that we have bought for the year because you can see there was nothing sitting on the balance sheet section as an asset. But at year end, we hadn't used all the stationery and packing materials. So that cannot be expensed because we haven't utilized that stationery and packing materials. Instead, we still will use it. So it will, it's in our warehouse, so we must recognize it as an asset. So we are going to therefore recognize it in, as an asset in the balance sheet section. So let's do the trade. And other receivables. So we have trade and other receivables as a prepaid expense for the 800. So in effect, because we haven't utilized it, we put it in as a prepaid expense. Then the second line item we have is packing materials. which will go under current assets as consumable stores on hand. For 1,600. Okay. Now the question is, why is the stationery put as prepaid expenses instead of an asset as consumable stores in hand? Well, the difference here is in the wording of the adjustment. Packing materials, we had counted that is 1,600 yen, and therefore it is in our store worth 1,600 yen. Stationery is estimated where the packing materials were physically counted and given a value. Where, consumer, uh, where consumable stores is estimated, you are not going to debit consumable stores on ham. You are going to instead use prepaid expense as an asset which sits under trade and other receivables. So that's very important to pick up the wording there. Here, packing materials is going to be under inventory as consumable stores on hand. Okay, now let's move on to our next entry. Before we do so, let's... Welcome to part two of adjustments. Today, we're going to continue with further adjustments to identify the impact on the statement of comprehensive income and financial position. The first ones I've typed out and then we'll add on as we go further. Provide for interest on the mortgage loan from South Bank at 15% per annum. Per annum means that's the yearly percentage for the month of June. Interest is capitalized. And then the sickle journal uh, adjustment that relates to the loan is capital repayments on the loan of 4,200 per month will be paid next year and it excludes interest. Now to calculate the interest expense, we're going to take the balance from the trial balance And remember, you can find this information in the Department of Education um, for Western, Prov Western Cape Province website. And you'll see that the interest expense amount on the mortgage loan is 31200 
and the balance of the loan is 644,000. So we're going to take that balance and multiply it by 15%, divided by 12 will give you the monthly interest amount of 8050. We then add that to the remaining amount of interest expense for the year to give us a total interest expense of 39250. Then for the capital repayments, they said that 4,200 will be paid during the year for next year. That means a total of 50,040, and there you'll see the calculation highlighted in orange, will be repayable next year, but it will only be the capital repayments, not interest. Now, why that is important is because for disclosure purposes, we are going to take the capital repayments for next year and put it under current liabilities. Because remember, the definition of current liabilities is a liability that's payable within 12 months. We'll put it under the trade and other payable section or as a separate liability under current liabilities called current portion of mortgage loan of 50400 to give us the non-current liabilities amount, we are going to take the balance as per our pre-adjusted trial balance of 644000 plus 8050 which is the interest expense we capitalize, minus the 50400 which was the current portion to give us a balance of 60160 well, um, 601,650. Let's move on to our next journal entry. We are given details of sundry expenses at year in. Station in hand estimated at 800 yen and packing materials counted at 1,600. The stationery is estimated, so therefore you're going to create an asset called prepaid expenses of 800, which sits under trade and other receivables. Packing materials was physically counted and that goes under current assets as consumable stores on hand, which is a type of inventory of 1,600. So there's two questions. Why are we recognizing assets of these amounts? And secondly, why are the assets different if both of them are consumable stores? Well, the first answer is, we are recognizing assets because these amounts were expense completely for the year and you'll see that sundry expenses the total is 9200 that is incorrect because some portion of it is estimated or actually counted to be in our warehouse and should be recognized as an asset we have not utilized that amount as yet so we still to receive the benefits from that amount and therefore we're going to have to recognize then the second question to be answered is looking at the wording. The stationery is estimated where the packing materials is physically counted. And when an asset is estimated for consumable stores, we are going to put it as a prepaid expense asset instead of consumable stores asset under the current asset section. Okay, let's move on to the next adjustment. So this is dealing with insurance policy, which was taken out on 1st September at a monthly premium of 2420. Okay, so let's see what's sitting in our trial balance. We have insurance of 29,040. I apologize, I skipped a, a section here. We hadn't taken the amount out from operating expenses section, sundry expenses. Okay. 
Welcome to Eduhan's part two adjustments. Today we're going to be looking at further adjustments that you could expect in your test. Let's get to one that deals with loads. So we have two adjustments relating to loads. First, we have to provide for interest in a mortgage loan from South Bank at 15% per annum for the month of June and interest is capitalized. And then we have capital repayments on the loan of 4,200 per month, which will be paid next year and it excludes interest. So the easy of the two is the capital repayments. Capital repayments in the next 12 months must be taken out of the main loan amount and put separately under current liabilities, trade and other payables called current portion of mortgage loan. And it will only be the capital repayments excluding interest expense that will be put here. It is a disclosure adjustment. There is no journal entry to it. Now coming back to the interest expense adjustment. In our trial balance, we're given the loan balance, if we quickly go to it, of 644000 and interest that is sitting there of 31200 in the mortgage loan. So, if we must take the balance of 644000 times it by the 15% annual percentage, and then divided by 12, we get a monthly interest amount of 8050 We then add this to the amount already recognized of 31200 to give us a total interest expense item of 39250 Remember, interest expense does not sit under the operating expense line item. It sits separately in the statement of comprehensive income called just interest expense. Then to get the remaining balance of the loan that sits in the non-current liability section, we take the balance of 644000 we add the capitalized interest for June of 8050 and we subtract the amount we put under current liabilities of 50400 And that will give us the balance of 600000 601650 to go under the non-current liability section. Then the next journal entries we deal with are sundry expenses at year N. Stationery in hand estimated at 800 Rand and packing materials counted at 1,600. Now because these amounts were initially expensed, and how do I know that? Is because we have a sundry expense item of 9,200, but no assets relating to um, sundry expenses under the balance sheet section. So that means everything was expensed. But because we have some on hand at year end or estimated on hand, we cannot expense it because we haven't utilized it. Therefore, we must recognize assets for those amounts. For the amount that's estimated, we put it as a prepaid expense under trade and other receivables. The packing materials, which is physically counted to be 1,600 and certain, that it is there will be put under inventory called consumable stores on hand for 1,600 and that sits under your current assets as well. Now the assets are different because stationery was estimated with packing materials were physically counted. Then under statement of comprehensive income we're going to have to take out that amount from the expense so minus the 800 and the 1,600 to give us a balance expense of 6,800 that will sit in our sundry expenses amount. Okay, let's go through the next adjustment. The insurance policy was taken on 1st September at a monthly premium of 2420. Um, Let's see what's sitting in our balance sheet. And remember, this information can be found on the Department of Education for Western Cape website. Insurance is sitting at 2904 and we have a 30th June year end. So, 
September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June. Okay. That is ten months. So if you calculate ten months, which is from the time we've taken the policy to the end of the year, times the monthly amount of two four two zero. Oh, we must have an expense of 24200 however we actually have an expense of 29040 sitting in our income statement as per the trial balance so you can see there so that means the difference of 4840 must be taken out of the insurance expense which sits under operating expenses and that 4840 will be sitting under current Assets prepaid expense, which sits in trade and other receivables because basically what we've done is we have paid more. It was mistakenly sitting in the expense amount, we had to take it out and recognized as a prepaid expense but from the adjustment alone you wouldn't have picked up that they recognize an additional amount so how did i identify this well with these type of questions where there's a timeline where it's insurance rent income those are the popular ones it's generally the case where you've prepaid um, an expense or you've received income in adva ad advance so that's kind of as you do more examples you'll kind of get into the habit of identifying uh, there must be a prepaid expense or income received in advance or um, accrued expense or accrued income okay and um, you kind of identify then okay what do I need to do and the easiest thing to do is identify what should be the expense just just kind of think of it what should I see in the end how much for an expense and compare to what you have and the only trigger you have to guide you towards thinking that way is if you go back to the pre-adjusted trial balance you ask yourself and you can see I've been doing it with every adjustment what items or line items in the trial balance refers to this adjustment and that will give you guidance and what amounts to use, what assets or expenses or income or liabilities you need to think of. Here, there was only an insurance expense. So the only thing I could do was to check if that insurance expense was correct. That's the only thing I could do. I only had that piece of information and the adjustment. When I checked if it was correct, I saw no, it wasn't. It was a lot more. Then you think about it, okay, if you recognize more expense than actually was meant to be recognized, what is that additional amount? Well, it could only be that the company prepaid for next year's insurance. So then you recognize an asset called prepaid expense. Okay, and as I said, through more examples, through working through it, and you'll pick up but with insurance policies um, rentals these are sort of a timeline based questions and they're very popular and you'll see we've done a few of them in the previous um, adjustment part one and it came through now again insurance policy but this is also a lesson to learn that adjustments are not going to be straightforward and say provide for interest or 
an amount was prepaid or it was underpaid or um, it's just going to give you some facts and you need to think about what to do. Step one, go to your trial balance. Look at what amounts relate to. Step two, check if those amounts are correct. If they are not, then adjust those amounts and then think about where does that extra bit go to. If the amounts are correct, then step three, check if the actual item, I, when I call it an element, what's an element? An asset, a liability, an equity, an income, an expense, if it's actually correct. So, for example, maybe they had an asset for the 4840 in the trial balance, right? But it went under bank only or it went under inventory for example and the information gave you some direction towards that then you'll have to take it out from there and put it in prepaid expense so kind of use it as a sort of think of yourself as a detective when you're doing these type of adjustments where they just give you factual information you got to find out where's the issue and it can only be with the amounts or with the elements, with the line items itself, the asset, the expense, the income, and the liability. Okay, let's move on to the next one. New equipment was purchased on one gen. And properly entered. And then they give you an amount of 26,000. Again, just a piece of information. Then the second adjustment they give you is new equipment is to be depreci to depreciated at 10% using the diminished balance method. Okay, so Let's see what information we have. We have equipment and accumulated equipment and do we have any other amounts? Just checking. None. Okay. Now, you can disclose an non-current fixed asset in the trial balance in two ways. You can show it like this with two line items, equipment and accumulate depreciation equipment. That means this 256,000 is the original cost of the asset. If they showed it as one line item, just called equipment, then it would be the carrying amount of equipment, which is uh, the cost minus the accumulated depreciation. So it would be the 256,000 minus the 184,000 and they could just show it as one line item. So always just be aware of that when answering non-current assets or fixed asset questions. Okay, so let's think about that balance again of the fixed assets, 256,000. 256,000 of that is new, 26,000. Old will be the 256,000 minus the 26,000, and that will give you 230,000. Okay. Then, that would go under non-current 
current assets as equipment. The total 256,000. So this line item is not actually an adjustment per se. Now, why you would say that is because there was two adjustments provided for it, okay? So all they did is they broke up the cost into new and old. But when you recognize it under non-current assets equipment, you're going to put the total 256,000. You're not going to split it up new and old. And that has no statement of comprehensive income implications. Now, the part that does have implications is the depreciation. When you deal with old and new, it's always good to also do your depreciation like that. So the old depreciation, let me go back to our trial balance. There was accumulated depreciation in equipment will be the 230,000 Rand cost of the old minus accumulated depreciation. That will give you carrying value. Remember, depreciation diminishing balance method, you take the carrying value at the start of the year and you calculate depreciation on that. And then you multiply that by 10% and that will give you depreciation of 4,600. And for the new, we're going to take the cost of it. Because it's the first year we bought it, there's no previous accumulated depreciation balance. So the carrying value and the cost value is the same in the first year. So the diminishing balance method says take the carrying value. So in the first year of purchase, the carrying value and the cost are the same. So you're going to take the 26,000, multiply it by the 10% to give you 2,600. Sorry. I skipped the step there. Because we acquired it on 1st Jan, that's, that means we only used it from Jan to June for the year. So that's only six months. So you must apportion the depreciation from the time you brought the asset into use until the end of the year. So that's going to be six months, January, February, March, April, May, June. So the new depreciation is going to be 1,300. Let's add the total depreciation four thousand six hundred plus one thousand three hundred equals five thousand nine hundred. So let's let's think about a few things. Firstly, How did we know that this equipment and accumulated depreciation amounts were at the start of the year? Because they say the extract is from 30 June 2020. Okay. How do we know that this accumulated depreciation amount you have highlighted does not include the depreciation for the current year already? It's an assumption you have to make that this Accumulated depreciation amount was at the start of the financial year. And how can I safely make that assumption? Well, under nominal account section, there is no depreciation expense. So depreciation was not calculated for the year for any of the new or old assets. So that's why the accumulated depreciation balance here at 184000 is for the start. It's the balance at the start of the year. Now, why is that important? Remember, when we did the calculation for depreciation for the old equipment, the formula is carrying value times the percentage, carrying value at the start of the year. And carrying value, if I write it out, equals to cost minus accumulated depreciation. And if it has to be at the start of the year, that means that accumulated depreciation balance must be for the 
start of the year and it would not include the depreciation for the current year okay so it's very important they didn't put in the brackets next accumulates depreciation that it was the balance at the beginning of the year but you kind of have to pick it up by looking at the trial balance seeing that there's no depreciation expense for the year if there's no depreciation expense for the year remember when you recognize depreciation you debit depreciation and then you credit accumulate depreciation so if you already recorded depreciation for the year in the nominal account section there will be a line item depreciation and under your balance sheet section the accumulated depreciation balance would then include that amount but because there was no depreciation line item we can safely assume that the accumulated depreciation balance on the balance sheet section of the trial balance excludes any amount for the current year and it's actually the balance at the start of the year and because it's the balance of the start of the year we can safely use it when calculating depreciation for the old equipment using the diminishing balance method again the new equipment no historical depreciation was the first jet was brought into use so the cost is the carrying amount okay then that will go under operating expenses, depreciation, and non current assets as accumulated depreciation. And the amount. So accumulated depreciation will be the original balance of 184,000 plus 5,900. 5, Let's bring up our calculator. 189,900. Okay, let's move on. Repairs costing 220,000, sorry, 22,000 were incorrectly debited to land and buildings. Okay, so nice adjustment. It tells you what the issue is. Why is it an issue? Well, you're not going to add to the cost of land and buildings repairs because repairs is an expense. So under operating expenses called repairs, you're going to have an amount of 22000 And let's think about the journal entry. We're going to re correctly re uh, recognize repairs expense of 22,000. We're going to have to credit land and buildings. And what do we do by crediting an asset? We decrease it, which is what we need to do because it originally was debited, meaning debited it increased land and building. So we need to decrease it by 22,000. So under non current assets called land and buildings you're going to take it out of 22,000 so what is going to be the new land and buildings amount well currently it's at 2 million and 776,000 then you're going to minus the 22,000 and it'll give you a new balance of 2054,000. Now, this is going to impact the land and buildings line item, which is the cost, 
and not the accumulated depreciation. This has got nothing to do with depreciation. The next journal adjustments, 150,000 new shares were issued on 1 July at 220 cents per share and correctly enter. Okay. So, remember, because the question is asking to show the impact of an adjustment, it does not necessarily mean all adjustments are something to account for because it was incorrect, okay? Similar to the new equipment one, we just showed how its impact is on the statement financial position. Now, we need to say, what is the impact of this adjustment? It's not necessarily a, something wrong that we need to go and correct the accounting records. It's just to show what this transaction or adjustment had an impact on. And here, it would have an impact in your balance sheet, balance sheet section, sorry about that, called shareholders equity, ordinary share capital, And it's going to be 150,000 shares. And I like to show things in Rand. So it's 2 Rand 20. And that gives you 330,000. How did I get the 2 Rand 20? I said 220 cents divided by 100. Okay. No impact on your statement of comprehensive income. Think about the journal entries. When you issue the shares, you're going to debit bank if you receive money or some receivable if they still owe you the money. And then you're going to credit ordinary share capital. So you are increasing ordinary share capital by crediting it. And that is why we are showing it as an addition to ordinary share capital. So you could ask me, okay, why are we not showing the debit side? Well, we don't know what's the debit side. So we are just showing from a disclosure perspective, it would definitely be shown as a separate line item under ordinary share capital. Okay. Next adjustment. 4,600 is owed to SARS in respect of income tax. So if you recall, when I did the company's introduction lecture video, I mentioned that we will touch on further company-specific transactions in future lectures, and this is one of them. It's income tax. Okay. Now, let's see if there's any amount in our trial balance that relates to income tax. Uh -huh. We have SARS income tax of 47000 which is a debit, meaning SARS, owes us. If it was a credit, it means we owe SARS. So, we, SARS owed us, so let's have a look here in the section that I'm going to highlight now, so we can do that as a little discussion. SARS owed us 47,000. Now we owe SARS 4,600. So it went from an asset to a liability. And the only way it can go from an asset to a liability is to first it must go from the asset 47,000 to zero, and then from zero, it goes to 4,600 as a liability. So that means if you think of the journal entry, you are going to credit SARS income tax the asset, of 47,000, you're going to credit SARS income tax, the liability now that we owe 4,600, 
and the debit will be SARS. I mean, debit will be income tax, which will be the sum of the 47,000 and 4,600, so be 51,600. Okay. Okay, so you debit the income tax expense, 51600 You credit the asset to eliminate it, and you credit the liability to create it because we owe SARS 4600 So that's just thinking from the journal entries perspective. So the calculation then is going to be 4600 plus 47000 will be your complete income tax expense. Sorry, put that wrong place. Let me bring it down. There we go. And then your balance sheet, you're going to have trade and other payables under current liabilities called SARS income tax. Now look at the wording for the expense and the liability or assets. Um, if it could be an asset, it'll still have the same name. But here it's a liability. The naming is when it's just income tax, and if it sits under your nominal account section, it's expense. But the asset or liability will have before it SARS and in brackets income tax. Okay, so please be careful of that wording. So easy to confuse the, the, the balance sheet and the income statement uh, numbers because of the wording. Okay, and remember we owed SARS 4,600, so that is why it's just the 4,600 that's showing at year end. To get to that 4,600, we had to do an adjustment of 51,600. Reduce the asset and then create the liability. Okay, next adjustment is directors recommended a final dividend of 10 cents per share. Please be careful when they give you information in cents. It's always best to convert it in rands. Okay, now this is also another company specific transaction. In our ordinary share capital, they said 900,000 shares are an issue. So it's going to be 900,000 shares times 10 cents per share. So that's if you divide it by 100, it's 0 0.10. And that will give you 90,000. That will go under shareholders equity. It will reduce retained income. Because remember, dividends comes off retained income. And because they said declared, they didn't say pay, you're going to have another balance sheet line item impacted under trade and other payables or your current liabilities. And it's called shareholders for dividends. Okay, there's no impact in your income statements. Dividends is a transaction with shareholders. Your income statement only shows transactions with third parties other than your shareholders. So dividends will never impact your income statement. And if we think about the journal entry, we would have debited dividends pay, and we would have credited shareholders for dividends. Here, the dividends paid will be closed off to retain earnings and decrease retain earnings. And the credit shareholders for dividends is the liability there of 90000 Now, someone can ask, but two adjustments up, which I'm highlighting now in yellow, we issued shares of 150000 So, shouldn't that be added to the 900000 And the answer is, firstly, congratulations on picking that up. That's very a very good observation. Secondly, no, it would not be added because it says that the adjustment was correctly entered. So that 900,000 already takes that into account. 
Okay, well, we've comprehensively worked through a quite a few adjustments in part one and now part two video. I hope it was useful and cleared up any confusions. You can see that there are specific ways to think about items and especially when the if there's an error, it's not straight up in your face and how to think about that. Um, look forward to more videos on our website, www.eduhans.co.za. Um, if you want the full comprehensive course, you, you can join that also on the website. Thank you for your time.